World War II. Bombers fill the night skies, forcing cities all across Europe to extinguish their lights. For those people who were living in the blackout, it must have been simply dreadful, totally debilitating in terms of deprivation of senses. In Berlin, the blackout presents the perfect environment for a violent predator, a dangerous psychopath preying on lone women. He's targeted at the very bottom of just sort of following them, and he escalated. Meanwhile, in London, rumors circulate that a mysterious, well-spoken gentleman is attacking women across the city. Anybody in those streets in the blackout could well have been a target. In both Nazi Germany and Allied Britain, police face a race against time to bring the terror to an end. The outbreak of war in 1939 brings with it a new and devastating military tactic large-scale aerial bombardment of civilian centers. The bombing of Warsaw by the Luftwaffe sends shockwaves around the world, and other major cities begin making preparations to survive similar attacks. In London, an emergency order is given that all lights are to be extinguished at nightfall, so as to make the city invisible to Nazi bombers. In Nazi Germany, preparations are already in place. The Nazis were the ones who first started the war, so they were prepared for it. Before the war, they put out blackout regulations that explained what civilians could and could not do, how lighting would work, how white paint would be placed in certain places so people might be able to see in the night. People were issued phosphorescent pins to be able to see each other, and they did practice runs. Everybody knew something was coming, so they were well prepared before the first bomb fell on Berlin. Berlin's blackout, compared to somewhere like Paris or London, was one of the most thorough and the most thoroughly policed. No light source was supposed to be visible above 500 feet. So all light sources had to be turned off, shielded, covered. Anyone that transgressed and had a, a window showing light would be warned initially by the police. And subsequently, if you carried on transgressing, there was every possibility you could be sent to a concentration camp. Accompanying the blackout guidance and intimidating propaganda are a number of strict new laws aimed at cracking down on any criminals looking to exploit the so-called special conditions of war. The Germans put out a law called a decree against public enemies. If any crime were committed during the blackout, it instantly was a death penalty case. As an example, some 13-year-olds stole a purse during the night. If they'd done it during the day, it'd be a very minor infraction. But since it happened at night, they were quickly executed. However, the threat of severe punishment does not deter every German. Rumors spread that an unknown assailant is using the cover of the blackout to attack lone women in the east of Berlin. The attacks take place in a garden colony, a semi-rural residential area where the trees and foliage provide useful cover. It tended to be an area where people lived who had fallen on hard times, were unemployed, single parents, that sort of thing. So it was an area where a perpetrator of that sort could possibly find uh, ready prey. And the circumstances of the war provide no shortage of ready prey. During the war, almost all the men are off fighting. So the women who are left behind have to take factory jobs. Germany needs them. And they're working all shifts. These factories run 24 hours. So they're coming and going on the train to get home. And some of these women are coming home very late. And then they have to walk through this isolated, dark garden colony to get to their houses there. He started at the very bottom of just sort of following them, making sounds. Eventually, he used a light to scare them, because it's a blackout. Everything's pitch black. I challenge any man not to be frightened and startled by something suddenly appearing in the middle of the pitch black when you're groping your way along and then suddenly shouting at them and that sort of thing. It's going to be immensely frightening. Although the attacks begin as low-level intimidation, they quickly escalate into fierce and violent assaults in which women are bludgeoned or even stabbed. 
These attacks involved actual sexual assaults. And although nobody was murdered during these sexual attacks, they were quite violently hurt. And they happened so suddenly and in the dark that there were very limited physical descriptions of the attacker. With scarce information about the mystery assailant and no obvious pattern to his attacks, the local police are at a loss to understand his motives. He has a deep-seated anger against women. All of that is a demonstration of a need for power. Now, why would he have the need for power? Because he felt he didn't have it. So he needs to top it up by frightening women. Then one evening during the summer of 1940, the attacker sets out on the hunt for his next victim. He thought that he was alone with a woman and so started to attack her. but didn't realize that her husband and his friend were not far away and were able to come in response to her screams. And they caught hold of the perpetrator and he was quite severely beaten before he managed to escape. And the reason that attack was so important was that it caused the perpetrator to change his method of operation. Following his near capture, the attacker moves his hunting ground to the nearby S-Bahn, Berlin's suburban railway system. The S-Bahn network would have been completely blacked out. There are lots of cases of people stepping off platforms and being killed and hit by trains during that period, so the lighting was very, very low indeed, if not non-existent. And on the trains themselves, it would be the same. It's not just the lack of light that draws the attacker to the S-Bahn. Many of the victims in the garden colony report a possible connection to the railway. As it transpired, most of those women who had been assaulted in the early phase of the perpetrator's activities had actually testified to the police and given evidence and said that the man that approached them was certainly in uniform, and some of them said more specifically he was in the uniform of the German railway service. 20th of September, 1940, and Gerda Kargol is taking the train home after a long day at work. A little intoxicated, she falls asleep and misses her stop. What she thought was a kind gentleman in a uniform for the S-Bahn offered to let her ride in second class with him. The compartment was empty and poorly illuminated. They made a bit of small talk before she fell asleep again. When she woke up, he quickly attacked her, hitting her over the head. He then thought she was incapacitated and tried to sexually assault her in the few minutes that he had between stations. To his surprise, she was still conscious and tried to fight him. He managed to throw her off the train. She miraculously survived this. And when she was found, nobody believed her story. The authorities dismiss Gerda Cargol as a drunk who has simply fallen from the train. As far as the perpetrator is aware, Cargol is dead, and he's committed his first murder. After a while, you got to up the ante because that goes hand in hand with greater excitement, greater adrenaline rush, greater expression of anger, and of course, you're getting better at it. And he is getting better at it. With renewed confidence, the attacker returns to the S-Bahn. There on a station platform, he encounters 20-year-old mother of two, Gerda Ditter. He strikes up a conversation, and Ditter invites him back to her home in the garden colony. They make small talk. Her two children are asleep in the other room. While they're in the kitchen, she's expecting some sort of consensual sexual encounter. But he then attacks her. He manually strangles her, and she tries to fight back, and he grabs a knife and stabs her repeatedly. He sexually assaults her and leaves. Her body is discovered the next morning, and the police are called. 
What's interesting about this killing is that it was initially not tied in with the previous spate of attacks which had taken place in the same area of Berlin. Berlin police would look at her life, which they saw as being rather dissolute. Her, her husband was away at the front and she entertained many men friends. Therefore, perhaps it's inevitable that she would fall victim to an attack such as this. So to some degree, in Nazi eyes, she deserved her fate. But Gerda Ditter was not a victim because of her lifestyle. She had unknowingly encountered a killer on the rise and become the first link in a bloody chain. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Berlin, 1940. A series of attacks on women in the east of the city is being treated as a low priority by the regular police. This all changes with the murder of 20-year-old Gerda Dieter. The investigation is now taken over by a higher authority, the Kriminalpolizei, better known as the Kripo, a once crack detective agency that has recently fallen into a state of decline. The Kripo were the equivalent of plainclothes detectives of Scotland Yard, or the FBI. They, however, were no longer as effective as they'd been before the Nazis had taken power because many of the better detectives had been forced out. Anybody Jewish, anybody that had been any sort of liberal or leftist, anybody that put up a serious fight to the Nazis were gone and replaced with party hacks. They no longer had this sort of experience with handling these sort of complicated matters. In November 1940, the Kripo begins its investigation into both the murder in the Garden Colony and reports of other attacks in the area. Evidence is thin and progress is slow. But while the police are occupied in the Garden, the killer is prowling his new hunting grounds on the S-Bahn Railway. By the winter of 1940, he has thrown two women from moving trains. Miraculously, both survive. Then on the evening of December 3rd, he strikes again. The killer's next attack on the S-Bahn was of a woman named Elfrida Franca. She was a nurse coming home from a long shift. This time, he was much more comfortable with his attack, so he didn't bother with any small talk. Once he knew they were alone, he used a blunt instrument to hit her on the head, hard enough that she died instantly. He wasn't going to make that mistake again. He barely had any time now, so he quickly took her body, perhaps did something sexual to it, and then threw it from the train. With the thrill of murder coursing through his veins, the killer follows up his assault on Franca with another attack on the same night. Outside an S-Bahn station, 19-year-old Ermgard Fries is brutally beaten and raped. She eventually dies from her wounds. Some of the time, sex was involved. Not always or even most of the time, the victims were raped. But sex was not the primary motive. It was killing, attacking women was the primary motive. And once he chucked them out of the door, they'd served the purpose of being a vehicle for the expression of anger. And that was it. Just wait till the next part. The discovery of two new victims puts even more pressure on the Kripo to crack the case. By December 1940, Nazi Germany is consolidating its grip on Europe, and the presence of a serial killer in the heart of the Third Reich is unacceptable to the regime. A media blackout is immediately imposed. The Third Reich sees itself almost as a sort of utopian society, a utopian state, and the existence of someone within that who is merrily killing people on the S-Bahn, damages the reputation of Nazi Germany. They still investigate, but they keep the truth of the S-Bahn killer away from the public. A public that, if informed, may be able to provide vital leads to the killer's identity. 
With the murders on the S-Bahn continuing and no movement in the case, Nazi leadership appoints veteran officer Wilhelm Lutke to head the investigation. Wilhelm Lutke was the head of the Serious Crimes Unit at the Kripo in Berlin, which normally handled homicides. Along with his partner, he would be in charge of finding the S-Bahn killer. This was a very high stakes job for him because Lutka was not a member of the Nazi party at this time. It was very, very important to him that he complete this job satisfactorily. If he didn't, he would likely get fired and sent to the front for a quick death. To aid the investigation, Lutka leans heavily on the expertise of Dr. Valdemar Weimann. Dr. Valdemar Weimann played a key role in this investigation he was both a forensic pathologist and he also was a psychiatrist, which meant that he was a very early profiler. And this overlap was amazing because it meant that he was able to look at bodies and interpret exactly what was done with these bodies. And he was able to work with Ludka, much like Sherlock and Dr. Watson. Ludka and Weimann set out to hunt down their murderer. But as 1940 draws to a close, more victims are discovered by the railway tracks. The pair make a breakthrough and link the Garden Colony attacks to the S-Bahn killer. Two attacks that made the connection between the Garden area and the S-Bahn happened in the same evening. Feynman conducted both autopsies and noticed that the same or similar blunt object had been used in each case. Having made the connection, Lutke and Weimann start piecing together the puzzle. But the investigation is once again impeded by Nazi ideology, this time by the belief that criminals could not possibly be drawn from the master race. The Kripo investigators initially targeted groups of foreign workers, forced laborers, POWs, for example, French, Polish, who many of whom worked on the railways, worked in heavy industry in that region. So it took a long time for the possibility to emerge in the minds of the investigators that this might actually be an ordinary German. January 1941, a pregnant mother is attacked and thrown from a train. She later dies in hospital. Another murder in February of a second pregnant woman leaves the police desperate. Lutka aggressively pursues his single most important piece of evidence, the description of an attacker wearing a railway uniform. He orders his men to start sorting through the files of thousands of railway workers, looking for any clues as to the killer's identity. He also devises a series of unorthodox methods with which he hopes to snare the perpetrator they would put uh, female police officers on the stations, in the trains, to act almost as bait. They had a couple of male police officers who were in drag to try and attract the killer. During one evening, a police officer in drag in a second-class compartment was approached by the killer. And just as the killer got close enough to attack, he realized that this was a man in drag and something was wrong. So the killer then opened the doors and he jumped out of a moving train and he was able to run away and escape. The near miss forces the killer into hiding and there are no more murders for months. Meanwhile, Lutka brings in hundreds of railway workers for questioning, though the thousands of hours of testimony offer nothing useful. Then, a railway employee mentions he witnessed a colleague routinely taking unauthorized absences from work. The Kripo has been chasing the killer for nine months. This could be the breakthrough that they are looking for. Berlin, 12th of July, 1941. For over a year, a violent serial killer has been using the cover of the Nazi blackout to attack women on the S-Bahn. The frantic investigation led by Kripo Commissioner Wilhelm Lutke finally uncovers a potential suspect. Railway signal operator Paul Ogozov. Just nine days earlier, the S-Bahn killer had struck again after a four-month absence. His victim, 35-year-old Frieda Kotziol, is raped and murdered between the Garden Colony and the railway. With Ogozov in custody, Lutke is convinced he has his man. 
Paul Ogoltsev was born in 1912 in rural East Prussia. He was illegitimate and was subsequently adopted by a rural farming family outside Berlin. So he grew up really just practically with the Third Reich, was pretty much his only experience as an adult. He became a rather early member of the Nazi party already in 1932. He also joined the SA, the Sturmabteilung, Hitler's brown shirts, which consisted mainly of sort of street violence against the communists. It may be that that appealed to him, appealed to his violent nature. Married with two children, Ogozov and his family live in an apartment on the outskirts of the Garden Colony, where many of the attacks have taken place. Under questioning, his alibi is flimsy, and he is unable to explain incriminating evidence, including blood on his S-Bahn uniform. The suspect told two stories. One is he'd had a cut on his finger and wiped it in his uniform. Another is that his wife had been hurt, and perhaps it was her blood. However, they knew enough forensics that this didn't match up. This was some sort of splatter blood in a place where it wouldn't otherwise appear. Accusing a member of the Nazi party of murder is a serious charge. It's vital for Commissioner Lutka to secure a confession. But Orgozov tries to use his party credentials to his advantage. He tried to sort of pull rank by saying, I would like it recorded that I am a loyal member of the SA. And this was in response to the tricky chief investigator who said, well, you know, before I can help you, uh, I need to know what actually happened. So step by step, Ludka led him through the evidence. He dramatically used this piece of piping that had been used to attack the victims. He used skulls that had been cleaned of these victims that showed where they were hit with this particular lead pipe. And so at some point, Orgorzov realized that he needed to actually confess to these murders. In desperation, Orgorzov makes one last appeal to the ideological prejudices of the Third Reich. Agolsov tried to chime with the spirit of the age, which was uh, he tried to suggest that the reason for his hideous, aberrant sexual behaviour had been because he had been treated uh, for gonorrhea by a Jewish doctor. And this Jewish doctor had treated him so badly and so appallingly that the result was this uh, sexual deviance that had been played out. With his full confession, time is up for Orgozov, the S-Bahn killer. On the 24th of July, 1941, he is brought before a Nazi special court. There was no jury, for example. You were tried by three judges who could make their decisions on the day, and very often the sentences were carried out more or less immediately. So it was a, a way of sort of fast-tracking justice in the Third Reich. After a hearing lasting just six hours, Orgozov is convicted of being an enemy of the people and is sentenced to death. The following morning of July 25th, 1941, at 6 a.m., the S-Bahn killer is taken to Plotzensee Prison, where he is executed by guillotine just 13 days after his arrest. As the execution of Paul Ogozov takes place in Berlin, German bombers are pounding London. The city has been subject to a strict blackout since the beginning of the war. By the summer of 1941, most Londoners have adjusted to the realities of life in the dark. At first, life in London came to a stop after dark. Theatres were closed, cinemas were closed, uh, nightlife stopped, restaurants didn't open, uh, there was no trade, prostitutes were forced off the streets for safety's sake. And then the good old British lit spirit kicked in and uh, life went on, albeit very much in the dark. Um, cinemas opened, um, nightclubs, theatres, the prostitutes came back in, in droves. As the people of London stoically try to carry on as normal, there are those among them looking to exploit the blackout for criminal purposes. The 8th of February, 1942. As the sun rises, the body of 40-year-old pharmacist Evelyn Hamilton is discovered in an air raid shelter off Montague Place. Evelyn Hamilton had been strangled. Some kind of um, ligature was found around her mouth but strangulation was actually manual. 
Ironically, she wasn't from London, she was passing through, she was going to move north to Grimsby to start a new job, and she was going to leave London because in the Blitz, she didn't feel safe. The police are called, and amongst those attending the scene is Detective Chief Superintendent Frederick Sherrill of Scotland Yard. Fred Sherrill was a copper of the old school, very distinguished, very experienced. He was the head of the fingerprint squad uh, at Scotland Yard, which then had the best bank of uh, fingerprint data in the world. And he could tell at a glance the size of the hand that had strangled Evelyn and which hand it was. It was left-handed. The investigation begins, but evidence of just how Evelyn Hamilton ended up in the air raid shelter at Montague Place is thin. Evelyn was previously at or near a lion's corner house very late at night. Now, whoever the perpetrator was could so easily have met up with her, misperceived her as being the prostitute because of the blackout and said, let me help you come home because it's so easy to get lost in the darkness. And then seen to it that they walked past the air raid shelter and pushed her in. She, being very respectable, said, get off, get off, I'm not having any of this, and unfortunately cost her a life. Notable pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury conducts the autopsy on Evelyn Hamilton to determine the cause of death. In this particular case, the nature of the attack, strangulation, together with pummeling to the body area, would mean that it was a lost temper, a rage, and that was the cause of her being killed. Evelyn Hamilton had been murdered not far from London's Soho district, the heart of the underworld in England's capital, and a pull for criminals, ne'er-do-wells, and servicemen looking for a good time. Soho was very much the, the center of pornography. Uh, it was the center of prostitution. There were a number of um, alleyways, meeting places, nightclubs, all of which became much more accessible because of the blackout. It was dangerous. It was a magnet, particularly for armed forces. The young soldiers a long way from home would gravitate uh, to Soho looking for a good time. Gangs operated there uh, and vice of all kinds proliferated. So the West End became chaotic and it stretched police forces quite considerably. As February the 8th, 1942 draws to a close, detectives from Scotland Yard are beginning their investigation into the murder of Evelyn Hamilton, knowing full well a dangerous killer is at large. Meanwhile, in Soho, London's den of vice, a pretty blonde prostitute takes a new customer back to her rooms as the night's blackout begins. The 8th of February, 1942, on the darkened streets of World War II London, a killer has taken advantage of the blackout to murder 40-year-old Evelyn Hamilton. As fingerprint expert Fred Sherrill of Scotland Yard opens his investigation, across town in Soho, Evelyn Oatley, a prostitute and nightclub hostess, is approached by a well-spoken serviceman. Ms Oatley had come to London in the hope of pursuing a career as an actress. But of course, that was put, paid to because the theatres were all shut in the Second World War. And as a consequence, she had to resort to prostitution. She was mid-30s and uh, she was estranged from her husband. And she had a flat in Wardour Street in Soho. On the 9th of February, Fred Sherrill and Bernard Spilsbury are called to the Soho room where Evelyn Oatley lies dead. Evelyn Oatley had been strangled, manual strangulation. And again, Fred Sherrill was able to say, by a left-handed individual. What was different, though, in the case of Evelyn Oatley with the mutilations, 
because not only had she been strangled, uh, but she had been severely cut in the abdomen and the groin area. Sir Bernard Spilsbury, the famous pathologist, carried out the post-mortem and he came to the conclusion, because of these mutilations, that we're talking about somebody who was a sexual maniac. This immediately screams a particular psychological condition which is known as necrophilia. It's the obsession and attraction to all things which are dead and it can come in non-sexual form or sexual form and this is very clearly sexual form. The extreme sexual violence in the murder of Evelyn Oatley is of grave concern to investigators. Although the two crime scenes bear some similarities, a link to the murder of Evelyn Hamilton is not made. Meanwhile, as the rest of London readies itself for another night's blackout, on a street corner near Piccadilly Circus, 43-year-old Margaret Lowe is approached by a well-spoken man in uniform. Margaret Lowe was another prostitute. She was known as the lady because she had airs and graces and was very choosy about the clients that she picked up. Uh, she had a 15-year-old daughter who was away at uh, boarding school and she was a widow. Lowe returns to her room on nearby Gosfield Street, accompanied by her guest. Nothing more is seen or heard from the apartment until her badly mutilated body is discovered by neighbors. She too had been strangled by someone using his left hand and she too had been mutilated. The mutilations here were even more severe than they were for Evelyn Oakley. This is classic in the spree killer MO. The mutilations become worse and worse. The attack is more furious. Four knives were used on Margaret Lowe as well as a poker. Uh, it was graphic stuff. Interesting thing is that whenever she had a violent customer, she would yell at the top of her voice, murder, call the police, murder, so that her next door neighbor would know that there was trouble and come running in. In this instance, there was no such call. This would indicate um, that the perpetrator has considerable social skills to be able to overcome the victim very quickly. It could be someone who's very charming, and here we're getting a dash of psychopathy coming in because you've got to be able to lie very capably, and that's a psychopathic portray. The 11th of February, 1942, following the murders of three women in London, Scotland Yard appoints Detective Chief Inspector Edward Greenough to head their investigation. Edward Greenough was a classic old-time copper. He is a solid, well-built, powerful man, no nonsense at all, straight as a die. The great thing about Ted Greenough was that he knew every villain on his patch. They respected him, they always called him Mr. Greenough or Sir. He knew the traditional faces, but he didn't know who was murdering these women. Greenough examines the evidence collected by Fred Sherrill and Bernard Spilsbury for the murders of both Evelyn Hamilton and Evelyn Oakley. While his instincts tell him that Hamilton was murdered in a hurry and for practice, he expects further attacks will be as violent as the one on Evelyn Oakley, and immediately he steps up the police presence in Soho and Paddington. His detectives begin questioning local prostitutes, and the mystery killer becomes known on the streets as the Blackout Ripper a name that shares an eerie similarity with an infamous murderer who stalked London some 60 years earlier. The mutilations carried out on these ladies were reminiscent of the work of Jack the Ripper, who had murdered a number of prostitutes in Whitechapel in 1888. The difference, of course, was that Whitechapel was in the East End, in a known slum area, Whereas in 1942, these killings took place in the West End, which was still affluent. And anybody in those streets, in the blackout, remember, could well have been a target. The 12th of February, 1942. 30-year-old Mary Haywood waits for her boyfriend in the Universelle Brasserie off Piccadilly Circus. And while she was waiting, she was picked up by an airman who was very well-spoken, and he brought her a drink. She says, it's now time for me to go off for my date, 
And he says, oh, well, it's all very dark out there. I'll show you the way. So Mary went off with the airman and they walked down St. Albans Street. And he pushed her into an alcove and began to strangle her. She all but succumbs when, by pure chance, all of us in pitch black, along comes a man who worked in a nearby hotel and he intervenes and the perpetrator runs off into the night. In his panic, the attacker makes a crucial mistake. As he flees into the night, he leaves behind an RAF issue gas mask, which bears a unique serial number. Scotland Yard now has a vital piece of evidence they hope can connect them to the killer. London, the 12th of February, 1942. At the height of the mandatory wartime blackout, a frantic manhunt for a well-spoken spree killer has a breakthrough. During a foiled attack on Mary Haywood, the perpetrator drops his RAF issue gas mask. Its unique serial number leads investigators to Regent's Park Barracks, where they identify the gas mask as belonging to Royal Air Force serviceman Gordon Cummins. Cummins was a wannabe air ace. He was in the RAF because of the glamour, the lure of the uniform. Churchill had called them the few, the fighter command back in 1940. But in fact, Cummins was a rigger originally. He fitted aircraft parts. He was not a pilot, though he was training to become one. Born near York in 1914 to working class parents, Cummins had an undistinguished school career, several low level jobs, and flirted with petty crime. He didn't have much. What he did have was delusions of grandeur, which is actually fairly common among serial killers. He affected a very clipped upper class accent, though he himself was not upper class. Married to his wife Marjorie for five years, Cummins is stationed at the Air Crew Receiving Centre at Regent's Park, where his desire to be thought of as upper class earns him the nickname, The Duke. He was unpopular in the barracks because of his airs and graces. He told stories about his sexual conquests and who his father knew and how much money he had. Uh, none of it seems to have been true, but he did tend to stand out as a rather unusual character. And above all, of course, he was left-handed. Late on the evening of February the 12th, the police take a statement from Mary Haywood. Meanwhile, Cummins remains on the streets, where he picks up another prostitute, Catherine Mulcahy. Ms. Mulcahy and he, undress, get into bed together, and very quickly, he punches her in the stomach. She still had her boot on and kicked him one in the body, giving her enough time to leap out of bed and run to an adjacent door, screaming, call the police. He calmly says, can you give me a light, please, for my cigarette? And then says, where are my boots, actually? Again, with his plummy accent. And calmly, having redressed, saunters off down the stairs as though nothing's happened. Catherine Mulcahy has had a lucky escape but Cummins' brazen attitude makes him careless, and he leaves the apartment without his RAF issue belt. Yet his murderous thirst has not been satisfied. Later that night, he strangles and sexually mutilates another prostitute, Doris Journey, at her ground floor apartment in Sussex Gardens. She is Cummins' fourth victim in five days. In the morning early, she was found with a ligature very tightly tied around her neck, indicating a fairly quick death, and once again supporting the view that there is principally a necrophilus interest here. A necrophilus interest which is shown by the deep gashes round one of the breasts, a necrophilus sexual interest again, in relation to mutilation of the genital area. February the 13th. 
Gordon Cummins is arrested at Regent's Park Barracks for the violent assaults on Hayward and Mulcahy. The question remains as to whether detectives can link him to all four murder scenes around London's West End. The evidence against Cummins was beginning to come to a head. Uh, we not only have his fingerprints at the scene of various crimes, fingerprints on weapons that were used, fingerprints on glasses. We have his gas mask, uh, which he'd left behind. We have an RAF belt, which he'd also left behind at another scene of crime. And he was identified by Markai in an ID parade. And above all, the only night when the murder did not take place was Wednesday, and that was his fire duty when he had to be at the barracks. He couldn't have got out on that particular occasion. Several items belonging to his victims are found amongst Cummins' personal effects. By the 16th of February, the evidence is mounting and the net is closing in. Greeno sits down in Brixton Prison to interview Gordon Cummins and is astonished to find that Cummins remains icily calm and dispassionate throughout. Most serial killers don't start cold and murder somebody. They build up to it. They carry out sexual assaults, first of all, and they gravitate to murder, and the murders become more vicious and more intense as time goes on. Now, in the case of Cummins, there is nothing. Before the murder of Evelyn Hamilton, there is nothing we can pin on him at all. There are a number of assaults uh, in the London area, which may have been down to him, but the police were never able to pin it on him. So if that's the case, then this is a, a very unusual type of serial killer indeed. What we have in Cummings, with increasing evidence, is narcissism, psychopathy, and an interest in necrophilia. And a clear demonstration, particularly the first of those two, of entitlement. What I want, I will have. It's a dangerous cocktail. We're talking impulsivity, we're talking determination, and we're talking a particular sexual obsession that make these ladies of the night so vulnerable. I don't believe for one minute Cummins didn't know what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing and that he found it exciting and that he knew it was wrong. The 17th of February, 1942. Gordon Cummins is officially charged with the murders of Evelyn Oatley, Margaret Lowe, and Doris Journey. His trial begins on the 22nd of April, 1942, and lasts just one day. Bernard Spilsbury, the doyen of pathologists, gave his unflappable account of what had led to the women's deaths. Uh, Greeno produced his evidence, Cheryl produced fingerprint evidence. And in some ways, it was a foregone conclusion. It takes just 35 minutes for the jury to convict Gordon Cummins. On the 25th of June, 1942, as the execution chamber in Wandsworth Prison shakes under falling German bombs, his sentence is carried out. The war was a godsend to Cummins because it meant that he had relative freedom to roam. He was one airman among thousands. London was full of airmen. How could anybody distinguish one from another? But the real gift to Cummins was the blackout itself. For serial killers like Cummins and Orgazov before him, the blackout conditions, which really means near pitch black, allowed them to do what they want to do and not be seen by anybody. And I'm absolutely sure of it, that they would have continued if they hadn't been apprehended.